What is up, internet? Long time no talk. It's your boy, Wes Gardner. You know, co-creator of NitroBeer.com, executive producer. I've been off in the shadows for a while, man. It's been crazy. Stuff's been going on. But you know what? I'm here. I'm back. And you know why. It's game of the year time. 2013 has been a hell of a year. And this is going to be a little different. I got some wild cards. I got some games I haven't played, but then I got six quality titles that you just have to pay attention to. So let's just get this thing started, shall we? First up, my wild card of the year. This is the game that I played about 20 hours of. I loved all of it. I just have no idea where it fits on the list. So I didn't put it on the list. But you need to play it. And that game is Saints Row 4. I think Saints Row 4 is hilarious, I think the writing's great, I think the missions are well done, the gameplay is very, very tight, they kind of fixed a lot of the problems with Saints Row 3, uh, and in a lot of ways it's a spiritual successor to Crackdown, and I love me some Crackdown. So just go out and play it, it's a lot of fun, a lot of laughs, but yeah, I just didn't know where it really fit on the list, I just know that everyone just has to go out and play it if you haven't already. And now my list of games that I did not play at all this year. Didn't play them, just didn't have money for them, or, you know, came over time, or I just, you know, you know, life happens. And these are the games that I didn't play, but if I did play, I know for a fact they would be on here. And j just the way it worked out, there's four of these games, and then I have six on my list, so you can kind of consider this my top ten. But these next four games, I didn't play at all. I know they're good. This is probably going to piss off a lot of people because they're like, Oh my god, that's my game of the year. But hey, I didn't play it. I'll get to it. I promise. I apologize. But anyway, Grand Theft Auto V. Looks amazing. It seems like it did live up to the hype, even though the hype was a crazy level. But it looks like the writing, the characterization, the things that make Rockstar games good, it looks like they did really well on that one. So I'm, I'm looking forward to playing it. Uh, Zelda, A Link Between Worlds. I love A Link to the Past. We played that for our, uh, oh, what is it, our Illiterates Book Club a long time ago. I think it was for the last Beardcast, actually. And love that game to death, and this just looks like a return to form. So I'm super excited to play it. I just haven't played it yet. I, I don't even own it. Oh, I feel so bad. The Last of Us. This is the one that kind of people fall on one side or the other. They, they think it's all worth the hype, and yeah, this is the future of video games and stuff like that. On the other side, people are like, yeah, it was a fun action game, but I just didn't get it. But I'm, I'm excited to try it myself just to see where I fall on that spectrum. I think, you know, there's one side of it and the other side of it, and in the middle is the truth. So that's what I'm kind of expecting going in, but I'm really looking forward to it. It looks, looks like a lot of fun. And the last one, this is the one that I guess I'm most heartbroken that I didn't play, is Gone Home. This seems like my kind of game. <laughs> I haven't played it. I know we did the Steve Gaynor cast. I know they did the spoiler cast. I haven't listened to any of it. I want to go in blind. Um, it, it just looks really, really cool. But a shout out to Gone Home and Steve Gaynor. I'm going to get to it. I promise. Hopefully it's on sale during the Steam sale. I'll, I'll buy it for like... Oh, I just have no money. Oh, I feel so bad. But anyway, those are my four games I didn't get a chance to play. I really want to. But, you know... Time's of the essence, and so is money. So we'll get to it next year. And now for my top six of 2013. Number six, Shadowrun Returns. Kickstarter's been one of those things that's, I don't know, it's a loaded topic. It's something that we've seen a lot of good come out of, some bad come out of, and just some very weird stuff come out of. But I think Shadowrun Returns kind of shows what is possible with it. The game's not very big, it's not very long, I, I think I'm right near the end of it and I've only played it for something like 13 or 14 hours. Not a super long game, but everything that's there is quality. The writing's good, it really brings you into the atmosphere of uh, being a shadow runner, and there's a lot you can do in the game. And you can tell that it was made with love from people that know the franchise. There's just the combat works really well, it works like kind of a, not a bare bones tactics game, but uh, something very simple to get into, but there's a lot to it, there's a lot of number crunching if you want to do it that way, but you don't have to. Uh, you can solve problems a majority, a majority of problems in very different ways, which is also cool, so it's definitely giving the user an experience that they want it to be tailored to. So I, that's why I definitely recommend it. It is number six on my list, but uh, it needed to be on the list because if this is where Kickstarter projects are going, then I'm all for it. Number five, 
Neverwinter. Free-to-play MMOs are... I think they're going. They're, they're becoming the backbone of that industry. Sure, you have World of Warcraft. Sure, you have um, some other titles that are still pay-to-play. But even some long-form MMOs like Lord of the Rings Online, Dungeons and Dragons Online. Uh, you know, you have you know Star Trek Online went from pay-to-play, and even Star Wars: The Old Republic went from pay-to-play to free-to-play, and they've been successful because of it. But Neverwinter was built from the ground up with free-to-play in mind. There are microtransactions, but. There's also user-created content, very much in the same way that City of Heroes uh, did some things, and Star Trek Online does the Foundry, and uh, it's actually called the Foundry in Neverwinter as well, but it actually elongates the experience. Um, you have something new to do every single day, they have the seasonal stuff, I'm about to go like go sledding here after I get done recording this. So, you know, just really cool stuff, free to play, it's on Steam, uh, you can get the starter packs and things like that, but the gameplay is great, it controls a lot more like a, a mix between something like a World of Warcraft and a Diablo. Um, it's very action-based, um, so it, it's a lot of fun to get in there, just play for 20-30 minutes at a time and log out. You could do the dungeon running, you could do raids, you could do all the in-game content and PvP, spend 7-8 hour binge sessions like a lot of MMOs are famous for. But the cool thing about Neverwinter is let's say you only have 20 minutes, you can go in, you can queue up your uh, crafting resources and you can send some people out to do missions. Then you can do a few missions, make some money, log out, you know what, you're, you're good for the day. So, a lot of fun, I do highly recommend it, and hey, it's free, it just costs the time of a download, so see if you like it. Number 4, StarCraft II, Heart of the Swarm. As bad as I am at StarCraft, I love it to death, and I think Heart of the Swarm was made for me. What it did is it rebalanced a lot of the units in the game um, from a competitive standpoint. It actually expanded on a lot of the lore um, in some good ways and some bad ways in the in the actual single player story. But the thing that Heart of the Swarm added to me was a sense of fun that wasn't there in the first in, in Wings of Liberty. And they add training modes, they add a lot more things you can unlock, they add different skins and perks and just all these things you can unlock while you're learning how to play the game either on a single player or multiplayer level. There's a lot of team based um, objectives, there's the arcade mode, uh, and these are things that were in Wings of Liberty but they've kind of upped the ante in Heart of the Swarm. So I mean there are training modes, you can even get a mentor, so someone who's better than you can, can kind of watch your games while you're playing them, kind of coach you through some stuff. Um, you can even play versus the AI. There's tons of achievements for bot stomping. There's So no matter how you want to play StarCraft, whether you're a very absolute beginner or you've been playing since Brood War or even the original, there is something here for you. And I'm not saying it's the easiest game in the world to get into, but really if you wanted to get into it and just see what it's like, StarCraft II Heart of the Swarm is the perfect place to start. Number 3, Fire Emblem Awakening. This is going to sound sacrilegious, I know, but Fire Emblem Awakening is actually the first Fire Emblem that I have played for longer than a few hours. And I don't know if it's just because, oh, pretty 3D graphics, or, you know, oh, here's some funny writing, and there's a lot of great characters, because I think the entire series has had that, but for some reason, Fire Emblem Awakening feels so well constructed as a game. They, they looked at it from every angle and they've covered everything, whether it's leveling up uh, your, your, your troops or, you know, doing side quests or just getting that fulfillment that you are becoming stronger, they nail it. And that's, that's something, especially for tactics RPGs, that that's kind of the addictive part. Once you see yourself progress, and once you see the team around you progressing because of how well you're doing, that, that makes the difference. And it's exciting because Fire Emblem Awakening is... It's a perfect Nintendo game because they constructed it with that in mind. You know, they, they did, did the one thing and they did it so well. And it's super addicting. And if you value your free time whatsoever, I don't recommend it. But Fire Emblem Awakening is one of those. It's a great game. It's a great rainy day game. It's a great guilty pleasure game. It's everything. It's, it is probably the best tactics RPG I've ever played. And that, that almost makes my heart break because of how much I love Tactics Ogre let us clean together. But out of those two games, hell man, you don't need another game for the rest of your life. Number two, Pokemon X and Y. I've been a Pokemon fan since the very beginning. Red and Blue came out, I had it on my nasty 
colored stained Game Boy. But me and my best friend across the street would trade Pokemon. I got red, he got blue. You know, I grew up with it. I think we all did. If you're listening to Nitro Beard, odds are very, very good that you've been there since the beginning. And Pokemon X and Y finally feels like they've they've evolved. Pardon the pun. But it really has. And I don't know if it's just the 3D graphics. I don't know if it's all the wireless features that it's done. But it feels like Nintendo has put its eggs in the basket and knew it would be successful before it released. And I know that's weird to say about Pokemon because of course it's going to sell a ton. But I think they realize that, you know what, the people that have been here since the beginning, they want something a little different. Or not necessarily different, but a little more evolved. So the wireless, I still think the internet usage in Pokemon X and Y is by far the best Nintendo's ever done for anything. If they continue that trend of evolution within their key franchises, Nintendo, I mean, Nintendo's a juggernaut right now, but they could start pushing boundaries, which is something I feel a lot of gamers think they haven't done in a while. But Pokemon X and Y is just a great game. Even if you never played Pokemon before, this is the one to start with. It has that same charm, that same fulfillment of capturing and adventuring. And once again, the same thing with Fire Emblem. They, they constructed the perfect kind of 30 minutes of fun, and you do that over the course of 30 hours. And Nintendo's famous for it, and they noted on this as well. So yeah, two out of my three... Uh, two out of the top three games I have for this year, Nintendo games. Like, there's a method to the madness, man. They are Willy Wonka. Number one, Bioshock Infinite. I know, I know, I know. Literally, I know. Everywhere else has given Bioshock Infinite game of the year. And you come to Nitro Beard because we have different opinions and all this other stuff. And oh god, how, you know, Wes, why are you doing this? I'm doing this because Bioshock Infinite is the game of the fucking year. <laughs> There's no question in my mind, man. And I've been through some personal stuff this year. That's why I didn't get to get as many games as much and things like that. But at the end of the day, Bioshock Infinite is the only game this year that I played that I connected with. Right? There's a, there's a difference between playing a game and enjoying it and playing a game and connecting with it. It's the same thing as a book. It's the same thing as a film. Whenever you watch a film or read a good book even if you don't agree with everything that the book says or that the movie does you can leave knowing okay I learned something from this Bioshock Infinite is definitely that game and Ken Levine has made a, a career out of making those games for me and and I guess that, that saying says it all I, I feel like they make these games for me like that's how well they click with me but this one on a very personal and real level this is a story of Booker and the story of him finding redemption for things that he's done. And he has to do it on his terms. He doesn't know what's going on. The world around him is very foreign and very surreal. But through it all, he knows that there's something to it. So he keeps pushing, and he keeps pushing. And at the end, he finds out the truth. It's not what he wanted to hear. But now he knows. And that's how I feel. This whole year has been like that for me. And I'm not giving away spoilers, I'm not going down that route. You have to experience it for yourself, but just know Bioshock Infinite, yes, the gameplay's great. Sure, there's some weird things, like Elizabeth throwing you money every 20 seconds. I mean, there, there's weird game ramifications of it that, you know, I'm almost upset that it's a video game. But this is the only game that spoke to me. And there's something to that. And I, I can't ignore it. I mean, maybe the other critics feel the same way, maybe they don't. Maybe they just think, hey, the shooting's fun, and you get to grapple on the thing, and then you get to, you know, and it is. It, it's a fun game. But for me, it it told me something, and it taught me something. And for that, it has to be my number one game of the year. All right, gang, that's it. That's my top six with my four games I didn't play and then my wild card. So I guess there's 11 games out of the whole shebang. But you know what? It's been a hell of a year. It, whenever the year started, I know, especially on the Beardcast and Free to Play, we talked about, you know, it's how's this year going to be? I don't know. It doesn't, you know, there's some big games coming maybe, but, uh, you know, how's it going to work? But I look back on it fondly, you know. Sure, we had some disappointments. Sure, we had some hilarious drama. Sure, the two new consoles came out. So there, there's a big future ahead. But 2013 was pretty fantastic for video games. 
and I know 2014 is going to be even stronger. It may not seem like it right now, but I have I have that gut feeling. But yeah, great, great year. Bioshock Infinite was fantastic. But hey, I'll see you guys in 2014. You guys have a great new year. Hope you had a great holiday. Stay safe. We love you to death. Thanks for coming to Nitro Beard. And you know what? I'm saying it right here. Wes Gardner's back, baby. We'll see you soon. Love you guys.